If you've listened to our show or any others on elk hunting, you should now be a believer that the best way to increase your odds at killing an elk this season is by learning how to call. Because y'all, being able to call elk is an absolute game changer. Problem is, where do you start? What do you need to know and how do you get started calling elk? On today's episode, we talk about the elk calling learning process, the gear needed to call elk, what it is and how to use it, the struggles and issues and how to fix them, as well as some tips and things to help you along the way. Also, some easy calls that you can do without anything but a stick or a grunt tube. Those topics, along with our Elk Bro shout outs and questions from our Elk Bro mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair. Adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkGrows.com, with your host Gilbert Ornelas and Elk Hunting Coach Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. First time with us. Glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those Blue Collar Hunters following us every week and grinding it out with us, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm the host of your show, Gilbert Ornelas, coming to you from, that's right, Joe's neck of the woods, Myrtle <laughs> Beach, South Carolina. How about that? At big O in the SC. That's right. And from Cuesta, New Mexico, the living legend himself, Mr. R.C. Knox is in the house. And from Cimarron, your elk hunting coaches, Leroy the Ninja Chavez and WWJGD. That's right. Your elk hunting genius is in the house, <laughs> Joe Gillian. What's up, fellas? Oh, my God. Hey, go hey. Going good. good. You just blew every bit of credibility there was, man. You start calling this boy a genius, man. Now, now everybody's going to be like, oh, that, we just hit rock bottom now, man. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert, man, you're up in my neck of the woods. I'm going to have to call my, my Uncle Enos and, and my, my cousin, <laughs> Billy Bob. My, my cousin Cooter. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm telling you, brother, if I've told you, it's – it's dripping hot here, boy. I mean, unbelievably hot. The girls have been playing great, man. So beautiful town. Uh, go, the ocean, you know, the ocean's gorgeous. Uh, the beaches are real pretty. Uh, I went and put my walk out uh, this evening on the beach. Uh, sand is a problem for old big oak. It is. Uh, <laughs> you walk about two and a half miles in that sand, son. You've done something. I promise. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually, you know, when I played football, one of our workouts, we put boots on and go run in the sand. You wanted to work the legs, you just go run in that sand over there, man. And and uh no, uh you're 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 in my country, man. I mean, you're in the country where folks they you know to have a good time you just sit on the front porch eat peanuts and fart man it's just uh just a good time <laughs> well man it's good people i met some really great people uh we're actually our first three games we played uh a team from long island a team from rhode island and then a team from south jersey so we've not seen any southern teams at all it's all been great softball great sportsmanship the town's been really awesome uh, you know, they welcomed us with open arms here. So, uh, you know, uh, definitely uh, be back. Sure. Uh, that's awesome. Well, you, you know why you haven't seen any Southern teams, don't you? Because they're smart enough not to yeah. be in Myrtle Beach in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. The college coaches are here. So, Big O's going to bring the crew and show yeah. out. So, yeah. it's been successful. Mission accomplished. Yeah, so for everybody that uh, that's listening, you're going to see you're and you're going to see in here Gilbert just a little bit jumpy, you know he's trying to he's trying hard to be able to make this happen for Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. 
Um, so the technology is going to have a little bit of jump here. Hope you guys can bear with us. Uh, we're going to try to give you our show. We're going to try to give you some information. What we're talking about tonight is real important. Even going to give you some other nuggets. And, and I'm going to start before we get started on the show, Gilbert. I, I yes. showed you guys this just a little while ago. And I want to share this, this with everybody else because today I met with the Hunt Wars crew. With, with my athletes today and, and we were doing our training session and we were talking about um, after you hear an animal and, and you get a, an elk that responds to you, you know, what to do after that, you know, when it's a certain distance and everything like that. So, or even if you're night bugling and you're trying to see where that animal is, or if you just want to get a better look at where you're at, you know, when you, we started out with Onyx. We went to base map. And really the reason we went to base map was that we were getting better detail on our maps, on our offline maps. Now they've added a really cool feature when you're navigating that from where you're at and you turn, it has a line that can go out and show you how far certain features are away from you is something that I really like. But let me tell you what, both of those we have, we like, we use. I came over because of one of our listeners had shown this and told me about this some time ago and started looking into it, but there is another free app. It's also, um, you can get on it free online. Now, if you want to download offline maps, you have to get a subscription and like everything else, you know, it's I think $30 a year, but I want you guys to go check out this and, and we have nothing to do again with this product but I think it is in an incredible tool, tool. And I'm gonna show you why I think it's an incredible tool. If you've ever looked um, at your app, when you are in a location and you try to, even if you use the hybrid maps and you look at the topo lines, it is so hard to really get a picture because those topo lines, they're not very tight and they do a, a they don't do a good job of really showing you where you're at. Well, I want you to go and check out a product at fatmap.com. Yes, you heard me correctly. I'm not being a hater. It is F-A-T-M-A-P.com, all right? And I'm going to show you an example of what this fat map looks like. In fact, I'm going to compare it, um, if I can. I'm going to compare it to my base map app and so that you can kind of get an idea of this. So um, I'm going to share this with you. And this, you're actually looking at my computer screen, and this is going to be a uh, base map. And this is, um, this is an area in New Mexico um, that we're looking at here. And if you look at it, and you look at these areas, it's real hard to tell. And this is a hybrid map, if, I, if I'm correct on this. I believe this is a, a, yeah, it is. I can see the orange lines. But yeah. so difficult to really tell what it looks like there. Now, I'm going to show you fat map. This is fat map. And I'm telling you, it is a total different story the 3d feature in this is just phenomenal and you can in on your app you use your fingers to move things around it's really really easy and when you're doing it with um on your computer you just simply use these tools on the side to be able to show you certain areas and you can get an idea. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one of these locations. I'm going to show you the exact location that we're kind of looking at on. So give me a second here. There's the reservoir. Let me get this focus to the north here. Good deal. All right. This is the area that I wanted to show you. Okay. So I want you to see this. Notice this clearing right here on this. I'm gonna go over to base map. It'll take a second for it to pop up. It'll be kind of a black screen. This right here is that meadow, okay? Yeah. That, that is that meadow yeah. right there. And uh, this drainage that you're seeing right here, do you have yeah. any feel of what that actually looks like? No, but this is that drainage. 
that is that drainage right there. Mm -hmm. Whole different field. Oh, okay. 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 Totally different. It, yeah, yeah, totally different. Now, here's something else that's really unique about this. And and this Fat Mount was not built for hunters. Fat Mount was built for hikers and different types of um, uh, activities like that. And I want to I'm going to show you some of these layers, for example, this layer that I'm going to put on right now is what we call an aspect layer. So when I click that on, you'll see that this is the key right here in the in the top, you can see it right here. So anything that is this color blue, this color blue right here is basically a north facing slope. Anything with the lighter blue is going to be a northeast like what's happening right here. So mostly you're seeing some northeast, you're seeing some northwest um, slopes that are happening. So this is really good at, and it's showing your south facing slopes. This is really good at if you're trying to locate those particular slopes and areas where you're gonna find elk bedding during the day, okay? Those areas that are most shaded in those areas. So here's another cool thing about this is not only does an aspect, it, you, it'll show you flat. These are the flat areas in those locations or what would be designated as flat. So you want to see what's steep, go to the gradient and what it does, it use color code. The light blue is the flatter. As it starts going towards green, it raises to about 15% elevation, uh, not elevation, but incline. And then as you get to the yellow, that's about 25%. So if I start looking and I'm planning on going up this area right here, I know that's about a 25%. Where you see a red like yeah. this, it's going from 35% to 45. If you start getting to a purple like that, that's a 55 degree slope right there. So that's telling you how difficult this is to get up right here. So yeah. this is a great way to, to start to break apart an area and to get a good look at it. And if I was somebody that um, was hunting and I had an animal sounding off, well, I could go from my base map, my onyx, to my, uh, to my fat map here to really get a feel for what I'm doing, what it looks like, how I need to attack it, especially if I've got thermals doing a certain thing and I've got a bull in an area and I'm up higher, can I come down through this part right here and then drop over and come up around this hillside to have an, uh, an action on that animal? So it really helps you you to get a feel of where you're at and what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I, I thought I would share that with everybody as just a, mm -hmm. an, another tool. That's just a nugget yeah. for everybody out there. That's, a, that's some unbelievable stuff, Joe. When you get a bull sounding off that you know that's, you know, let's say he's a quarter mile from you mm -hmm. and you hear him, you can actually pull that up and look what his terrain's going to look like in, in the park that he may be in or, you know, in the trees where he's at, if he's on one of them northeast facing slopes where he's going to bed down, then you know exactly what that terrain is going to look like. That's, and that's take it one step really further, cool. man. You know how we're always talking about connecting, you know, water, feed, and yeah. bedding. Well, when you're in there, you can pop that up. And where is the nearest north, northeast face slope? Yeah or area that they might be moving to. How does that correlate with what the wind is doing right now? Sure. And you start to get a picture of where those animals might possibly be going when they leave that sure. area, All right? Oh, that's good so, stuff, for yeah. sure. Well, guys, you know what time it is. It's time for the Elk Bros shout outs. If you're new to our show, this is a shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. And Gilbert, we yes, got sir. an email, man, from a gentleman from a grinder in Texas, he's looking for a big O shout out. Sounds good. Well, here is a big O and Elk Bro shout out to Chris Luker Jr. from none other than Carthage, Texas, the home of the battling bulldogs. Get that pack, brother. You never know when we may need some help. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that right? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, brother. Chris had we'll said, be calling Chris. Yeah, Chris said he'd love to come pack some animals out for us. So I'm putting I'm putting Chris on speed dial. There you go. That's so, what we need. Chris, the pack rat Luker Jr. <laughs> sure. 
Next up, let's start our shout outs with a tip from the old Billy Goat himself, Bob Collins. Hey guys, this is the old Billy Goat with your tip of the week. Everybody tells you you gotta stay hydrated. That's great, but let's start with first with the signs of dehydration. Everybody knows you get the dry mouth, because you also can get lightheaded, leg cramps, seizures. It feels like somebody punched you in the kidneys. I mean, because your kidneys not getting enough water through them to, to flush them out properly, then, you know, they could bother you. Very, very important you stay hydrated. These Nalgene bottles work great, but the problem with them is you don't start drinking on them until you start feeling thirsty. You're already behind the eight ball as far as trying to stay hydrated. Get your of a bladder system. You can sip as you're moving like an IV needle for hydration. You're getting a little bit in there and it's constantly absorbing it. The big drawback to these and all of a sudden boom no more water. I do carry one of these that's full in my pack. I've got backup. Next question is how can I tell when I'm actually hydrated? Look at the color of your pee. If your pee is this color you're on the verge of dehydration. It's even actually to the point where it's orange where you're becoming severely dehydrated. Pee should be coming out clear like this here and that's where you want to be guys. So that's your tip from the old Billy Goat. Stay hydrated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Good job. Yeah. Good job yeah. Billy Goat. Good job. Yeah, I, he is something else, man. And he's, you know, it's, he's been busting butt, um, sending in all these videos, trying to help with some tips and stuff. And I'm sure everybody appreciates those out there. Guys, now for our top listening cities. Chav, you're up first. Okay, this week's top listening city is part of the Dallas-Fort Worth region and is an inner suburb of Fort Worth. Surrounded by five major highways and established around World War II, it's home to 10 parks and has 35 factories that produce sheet metal products, clothing, plastics, and fiberglass. One of the top attractions is shopping at one of the three mega malls nearby in Haltom City, Texas. Is that right, Gilbert? Haltom City, Texas. Haltom yes, City, sir. Texas. Haltom yeah. <laughs> yeah. City. Gilbert, you been there? Oh, man, many times. Drive through it all the time when I'm at Fort Worth, or Burleson, around that area in the DFW area. Yeah, Halton, Halton's a good city. And, and never, never heard of Halton. So, guys, we're really glad to have you. Top listening city. And I mean, they cranked it out to get that too, man. We had tons awesome. of listens. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. Now we know awesome Halton right there, man. Yes, sir. Considered one of Georgia's best managed cities, it's a suburb of Atlanta and known for its town square. Fire destroyed most of the city here on three separate occasions back in the 1850s. As luck would have it during the Civil War, during General Tecumseh Sherman's destructive march to the sea, once again, this city was one of the first casualties. The town was set on fire and burnt down. Man, I tell you what, these... This we ought to give them a award just for overcoming, man. You know, oh, yeah. Marietta, Georgia, man. Burnt the whole town of Marietta, Georgia. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of many. <laughs> yeah. They they did not they did not want um anybody to get what they had. I guess, and you know, I guess during the Civil War, that's what they would do. Is as they and and it happened during the Revolutionary War. You didn't want folks to get resources left behind you know, um, for the other army to have. So you would just burn it on the way. Yeah. Scorched earth policy. That's how Napoleon lost. And that's how the, the Nazis eventually started losing World War Two. Yeah. You know, the, the Russians burned everything down twice. You know, Joe, <laughs> you know, Joe, I, I had to come through Georgia to get here to South Carolina. I stayed in Augusta, Georgia, and uh, a couple of our real good elk hunting buddies, uh, are from the Booger Bottoms in Georgia. So shout out <laughs> to Mr. Waddell and, and crew. I know they're getting their boots ready to rock and roll. Um, next up, Joe, situated along Sandy Creek and nicknamed for the gateway to the Rockies, it is Colorado's third largest city. This city, which encompasses 46 square miles, is also known as the City of Lights because it's one of the first cities in the nation to illuminate its streets with electric lights. It also has a large military presence, among them Lowry Air Force Base and Buckley Space Force Base. And none other than Aurora, Colorado. Aurora, Colorado. Uh, Sir. Space Force Base. We have a space, Buckley Force, base now? space Force Base. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Space do Force now. is the real deal, man. <laughs> I, I did not know that, man. Pretty doggone yeah. cool. Okay, next next city. This city was once known as the gateway to the Chain of Lakes, still evidenced today by its motto, Heart of the Fox River. It is part of the Chicago metropolitan area. It was named after a prominent U.S. Army officer in the Black Hawk War. The Fox River flows through the eastern part of the city and is surrounded by natural lakes and streams created from receding glaciers from the last ice age. And this is in McHenry, Illinois. McHenry, Illinois. We get, we get so many listeners. Do you know one of our top all time? Oh, get this, guys. I didn't tell you guys this. Um, by this time tomorrow, uh, this podcast will have hit 300,000 downloads. Come on, man. Wow. Awesome, Joe. 300,000. 300,000 downloads. Another milestone. Another milestone, man. <laughs> We, That's so uh, cool, Joe. we now have listeners in over 7,000 U.S. cities and 77 foreign countries, man. Wow, so, man. You know, who, I, knew? who knew some redneck boys that want love to elk hunt could get together and talk about it and people would tune in to listen to our wild asses. <laughs> <laughs> now, all I can say is, man, you know, when you when you see that and you see everything growing exponentially like that, is it's all about you guys out there that are listening. And yeah, and also, we appreciate y'all. You know, I, I always want to thank them for this too, Gilbert. Is is that we are, and I've looked at a lot of shows, and maybe it's because we're still young. We're we're not. We'll be three years old in at the end of February, like when Chad yeah. turned seventy. You know, I think we're going to celebrate that, <laughs> that birthday together. Uh, but we're about two and a half years old, and um, our our ratings and our reviews. And what I mean by that is, people can give us a five star rating, right? Uh, yeah. Or they can give they give us one, two, three, four, five, right? So we have something like I don't know, two hundred and fifty something ratings. We have one one star we have one two star we have one four star and the rest are all five star right uh, i told you them one and two are my that's my my sister and my mom probably right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I didn't understand it's so smart alex somewhere joe <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't understand the four rating i'd rather people just say like you you know that that's like kissing your sister yeah. i'd rather you know, it's just like well you know i this is an olympic year and and you, you just did not have everything quite you know it's like the gymnastics you just weren't tight enough perfect or, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. You weren't perfect. Yeah, man. But I, I you know, I just want to thank because, w- like I said, we get, we have all of those ratings, and we are one of the very few shows that we get reviews um, yeah. to fifty percent of our ratings. So, you know, um, we're actually almost to three hundred. We're almost to three hundred ratings, and we have a hundred and fifty something reviews. So, that says that you guys out there, um, it it means that you care enough to not only rate us, but you're willing to spend a little bit of time, go to Apple Podcasts, and and you know just let us know that what we're doing means something to you. And and it does mean something to us. I tell you what, we read those things all the time. And it's really our motivation a lot of times to get on here every week and try to get a show to you guys. So, and it's not yeah. easy, man. I, no, on. it's not. We, we, you know, it's not easy because Gilbert Big O's on the road all the time. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we do it from our truck or from our hotel room or wherever because you know, it doesn't matter wherever we're at. We still love to talk about it. Well, my big worry was, remember, Chav, I was like, well, what are we going to talk about after three weeks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Sure. Man, well, like, yeah, uh, here we are two and a half years old. We find something, you know, to every, talk about. Every new, yep. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, with, with you and RC and, and Gilbert, I think uh, – we probably forgotten a lot of stuff that uh, would help people out, and it just comes back to the front of the brain yeah. and said, "Oh, I know yeah. somebody else that we could talk about, or you know, help people flatten that curve." It yeah. was like our, you know, our last pod podcast when we talked about hunting a herd bull. I, that kind of stemmed out of one podcast where we just talked about at the end of the podcast, and 
you know, Joe's like, well, let's have a podcast where we just talk about how to kill a herb. You know, well, so, I, I and yeah. I can tell you this too. You guys listening, you guys inspire a lot of these shows. You know, well, I I re questions. received just a um, an email mm -hmm. the other day um, from Mr. Yeah. Rasmussen that said, you know, um, we're going to be hunting uh, with a rifle during the rut. What's that going to look like for us? How's it different from a bow mm. hunter to a rifle hunter? So next week, y'all, we're going to talk about that. All right. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. We're going to talk about how that, how that's different. So a lot of you guys, when you send stuff into us, you actually inspire us for each of our shows. So when your questions come up, it's huge that you let us know what you feel you need and the things that you're confused about and understand something, man. If you are having difficulties with it, I guarantee you there's other people just like you. And like Chab said, there's, there's things that we now do naturally that we take totally for granted. You know, it's, it's almost like living here in Cimarron. Sometimes I walk outside in my yard and I forget to really look around because I take those mountains for granted, the incredible views that we have, this incredible oh, yeah. view that we have, you know, mm -hmm. and how many people when they drive here, man, they're busting out cameras and you see them and they're, and you go, what are they taking pictures? Look at them mountains, you know, and it's, yeah. Yeah. you know, sometimes we take things for granted just because we've exactly. done it so much, right? Hi right. Gilbert. Last All right, one. Joe. Last up. Last up with this last city. This city's part of the DFW Metroplex and is famous for being the international headquarters for five Fortune 500 corporations and home to over 3,500 companies. It was named after a surveyor's wife's favorite author. The Dallas Cowboys maintained its headquarters here at the Valley Ranch from 1985 to 2016. It has been ranked as one of the most racial and ethnic diverse cities in the U.S. in none other than Irving, Texas. Irving, the lone Texas. Irving. state showing up in the house again, Joe. A Texas. shameless plug here. If you guys are in Irving or around the town of Allen, go see my brother Bain Brooks at Two Rows Restaurant. Uh, we love Mr. Bain. He supports all our teams up there playing in the D DFW area. So you guys from Dallas, if y'all ain't been to two rows, they got the best bacon in the world there. Go check them out. <laughs> you know, I got a little worried, though, when I was, you know, because Chav does all these cities and I just kind of plug in all of the information. And and I was reading along and, and I hadn't looked at what the, the city was or anything. And it says it's been ranked as one for the most racial. And I was like, we're not Whoa. putting a city on like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, man, everybody needs to lighten up, Joe. <laughs> I, I can tell you that's why it's always important to you know that, like when you put titles on things or you have sentences it's always yeah. important to put things on because it can have totally two different meanings if you don't get it no doubt no doubt <laughs> no, <but that's> <laughs> for sure so the cowboys they're no yeah. longer in irving texas no, they're in valley range oh so, and that, that's, yeah, that's actually not a suburb of uh, frisco uh, yeah, Frisco Valley Ranch area. So oh, okay. that's all oh, that all oh, that Metroplex, man. It's got Allen, Irving, uh, Prosper, where Manano just moved. Uh, all of that in McKinney. What's, what's Manano's uh, address, Allen. bro? What's his? <laughs> what's Manano's address? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Uh, all, all of that area up there is just, they call the DFW Metro. Okay. It's, it's like Houston, man. Houston's <laughs> got so many surrounding suburbs of it, you know. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's right. huge. Yeah. Let's let's rock and roll, man. The topic of tonight's show. Betcha. For some of you guys that you have all your calling down, oh, that's great, man. Um, if you want to listen, listen right along. But we have – there's a lot of folks out there that – have heard us say that the biggest game changer when it comes to elk hunting success is calling elk. And I think we've convinced them and I think they're believers, but a lot of those folks, when they get there now, they're like, and, and trust me, I know what it feels like because um, when I became, when, when I got that bow back there and uh, had to start shooting releases and, 
doing all of this stuff. I walked into an archery shop and it's like, holy moly, man, where do I start, dude? You know, walk into the future. Oh yeah. man. <laughs> and and the I nuclear bow set up. And I think for these guys, man, when we say that they need to, they want to start using elk calls. They want to start using diaphragms. They want to do things that are going to increase their odds and stuff, but they're not sure where to start. They're like, but what now, man? How do I do this? And we get tons of questions about what elk calls and grunt tubes we use or that we recommend. In other words, what gear do they need? What specifically do they need to start calling elk and you know so let's let's have that conversation we're going to talk about the gear then we're going to talk about the difficulties that learning process the difficulties that we have each had or we could still be having learning to call so we're going to talk about the issue talk about the problems and then we're going to talk about the results and how we fix some of that stuff and what we still need to fix and maybe ask some questions to see what can you know how we can do that and the other thing is is for for those of us that have gotten through because there's stages man i mean it's just like i can remember my daughter ashley she brought home a musical instrument because she was going to be in band and she was playing uh a, a sax and um she came in and she had to put her mouth a certain way to get that sound. And she struggled and struggled. I am not able to tell you how many nights of horrible, horrible noises and tears and everything that we had coming from that room, man, until she could get it right and then start playing music. That's something that I think is important for us to cover as far as that, man. What is needed to fix that? What has changed the game? What is it that helped her or helped us to get from one point to another so that we started to sound like something, so that we started to make the sounds, okay? And then we're going to give some tips from what we've experienced, tips, recommendations to get better. And then I really want to end up talking about some free calls and stuff like that. Now, let's, let's talk, Chav, about the different types of calls as far as in order to make elk sounds. What's available for people? Well, you know, other than the diaphragm calls, which will be the, the main thing we'll talk about, uh, the Hoochie Mama is one that I use. Mm -hmm. And... They come in different sizes, I guess. It's like the calf call and the cow call. Mm -hmm. And the thing about those things, you know, uh, you can you can call, you can squeeze it just right and get the perfect call. And sometimes you can squeeze it a different way and get a terrible call. So uh, that's what's kind of rough using those. Uh, I, I even got to the point where I, whenever I was getting a good call, I got a magic marker and made a... Uh, like a, a print of where my thumb goes so I could put my thumb in the same place every time <laughs> and I managed to get consistent at that but still every once in a while it, it wouldn't get the same type of call and I wasn't able to alter it you know where uh to make it sound like different different cows coming so for 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 people that don't know what a hoochie mama is because uh you know we talk about it and you'll hear people joke about there's been a lot of elk that's been killed with a hoochie mama but basically what we're talking about is there's external calls and there's mouth calls in other words like mouth diaphragms that go inside your mouth external calls are any kind of call that you use outside the mo the mouth right gilbert you have one there what's that one called yeah, yeah i got it and this is a flex tone call from a bone collector series uh it's called uh bull collecting so there's those it's and it's awesome to operate show what it looks like there so show what it looks so like. it actually has an attachment where you can put a tube on the end of it for bugling and everything, or you can just wrap a lanyard around it and carry it without the tube if you just want to use it to make cow sounds and stuff like that. I mean, it's very simple to use. Um, you know, it's user friendly. You just put it in your mouth and bite down on it. I mean, it makes really good sounds, right? Straight yeah. out of the box. 
you know. Yeah, and and it's easy. Um, and we're going to talk- easy. Yes. Only thing is, when you draw your bow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's easy. It's just something you got to hold on to, right? Right, and and we're going to kind of talk about um, those different things about that, those issues, problems, and results of those problems here. Um, yeah, the limitations. Like you, Joe, I'm I'm a huge, you know, I wear out uh a lot of calls before i ever get to the elk woods and then got to figure out which one sounds right but i'm a diaphragm guy right yeah uh, but i have this in the bottom of my pack in case i lose my diaphragms or whatever i mean this is your back this little rascal get you out of a bind if you need it you know? yeah so so what what i want to do guys is 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 i'm going to show you this right here is a diaphragm call. Now, this particular diaphragm call, a lot of they can be made so that they just look like this on both the top and the bottom, where you're seeing the latex. That's what, without any kind of palette plate or any kind of dome, like what is what you see on here. We have a dome on this one. Some will have uh, a palette plate. Now, the whole idea of this on top of it is to create. Um, without you having to worry about how high your palate is or how low or how close that latex gets to your palate, this automatically creates that area right in there and helps place that inside the roof of your mouth. Okay. And a diaphragm call has, you know, it has what they call like the, the skirt tape on it, right, right around here. You have latex on it. Um, you have the clamp that holds the latex that's skirted like that. And this is what you call a frame that, uh, that I was talking about, that U that's on there. And those frames come in different sizes. And the reason that those sizes are important is that all of us have a different type of palette. You know, we have, there's average palettes, there's high palettes, there's thin palettes, um, there's wide palettes. And so those frames help to match that up with what works for you. Uh, some people have a really wide palette and those people like, for example, I believe um, this one is probably, I'm gonna measure this out on the inside, but I, I think this is a half inch and then the larger frames will go to a five eighths. There's even some three quarter inch frames. I think a lot of the turkey calls when they started out were, yeah. were that, right? So, and a lot of guys started out. And I have to trim all mine. What's that? One more I have to watch? trim all mine. Right. So I have a smaller palette, so I have to trim mine. And and so what he's talking about and that when, there is. You, if you show it up there, if you, yeah, if you show it up there, Joe, you can show where we trim it. Yeah. So what some, some people, because they, and it's not so much that they have, if they have a smaller palette and it's a deep palette, they end up pushing that tape down on the sides quite yeah. a bit like this. And then it like gets to their teeth and they have a hard time getting a seal. And so what they'll do sometimes is actually trim that tape. So it fits better up in there. Another thing that happens yeah. is that in the back, if you have a real tight palette in the back, you'll start developing if after you do a lot of calling, um, and once your, your, um, uh, your diaphragm calls gotten wet, you'll start to see something like a crease like that. Yeah. And it's generally going to be two of them because it happens on both sides where you see something like this that's happening. And basically what's happening there is because your palate's so tight up there, it's actually trying to push that tape to be able to seal and press up against the roof of your mouth where it's creating those creases in it. So what I'm gonna show you is what is best to do when you have those creases is find those creases and then cut a notch where those creases are so that now that can actually come together and create a yeah, seal in the, yeah. in the, on the roof of your mouth. If you're getting a <laughs> noise or you're not getting air to go over your tongue it's actually going above the the diaphragm call where it's on the roof of your mouth that's going above that tape and through there you're losing air there that's because you don't have a seal and that seal is critical the other thing is is placement of this 
Uh, and I'm going to tell you, as you get more advanced, you can change the placement of a diaphragm call, but that placement is going to be right up so that that is almost right behind your eye teeth. So it's more towards the back of your mouth, right? It is not up towards the front behind, just right behind your front teeth. It's more about your eye teeth. So, and here's the, here's the other thing. A lot of people think it has to be in your mouth straight. It doesn't because they said my mouth is crooked as can be. I've got a yeah, crooked as a dog kind of leg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me if you can see this. I know this is going to be ugly. Yeah, it's crooked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, <Lord. laughs> so, it's, yeah, but it wasn't straight. No, it's not straight, man. And uh, and and I get a seal like that, and I've been calling that way for almost 40 years. So I want our, I want our listeners to know something, Joe, not only do you have probably the best elk caller in the nation showing you what he does. And now he's actually showed you the inside of his <laughs> mouth. Okay. <laughs> now that's the point. He has exposed himself <laughs> to our elk brother. I'm telling you right hey, now. That's one you of you guys. Y'all have got to understand this cat is really good at elk calling. And what y'all are fixing to get is a lesson that's going to change the game for all of y'all. Hey, dude, I promise you. That's I've been one of those sentences that taken out of context. Could I've been his student himself? for over 11 years. <laughs> and I'm telling you. <laughs> what? I, that's one of those sentences taken out of context that doesn't work out, you know, exposed himself to you, you know. <laughs> <It's not exposed. laughs> yeah. Only if your mind's there, Joe. Only <laughs> if your mind's there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you right. believe you would go there with this proof. The <laughs> mafia is not here. That's right. Y'all yeah, know right. where I ran to that like a freaking freight train, son. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, you're right so, about that, man. So, yeah, that's so true. In all, in all seriousness, <laughs> this is this is fantastic stuff. Y'all got to listen to Joe. He's going to teach you something here for sure. So the other thing I want to tell you about the diaphragm call is, is you're going to see, I'm going to give you some different diaphragm calls right here, and I want you to see the latex. So you can see this latex right here is red. This one is like a white latex. This one is like a black latex. And latexes come in different thicknesses and tightness, okay? And the thicker it is, the tighter it is, the more difficult it is to get out sometimes these softer tones and things that you wanna do, right? Okay, and uh, the the, the thinner the latex is, the easier it is to use and, and do some of those calls. Now, Gilbert, dude, I see you laughing over there, bro. So, and the mafia is not here, man. See, I told you. <laughs> You're going to have to cut this shit, Joe. <laughs> this, is like having, latex, this is like trying to teach a seventh grade class. My bro. ass, Joe. <laughs> you boys no. need the thin latex. I don't know what to tell you. Why does it need that thick shit? Get her done. <laughs> so, so why why do you have those? Well, let me tell you why, man. Because if I'm cow and I want to be able to subtle, soft sounds, I want a thinner latex, man. But I don't want it so thin that I'm not able to maybe do a little bit of a bugle or so that it it before you know it, it's worn out. All right. Yeah. And, and there's some things that can kill latex. He kills latex. So you never want to use, leave them out in the sun in your car, yeah. your dashboard. When you're not using them, put them inside your refrigerator. Um, try to keep them someplace cool. Try to keep them dry as much as possible. That's why I use this right here so that yeah. when I'm not using a call, I can go ahead and put it on my, um, my reed quiver right here. This is made by Bendable Products, B-E-N-D-A-B-L bendable products you can get them from there and we carry them in our store um, quite often as well um, from them but i love the reed quiver because if i'm doing my thing out there and i need a call i'm not searching all over the place for it i know exactly where it's at right there so the thinner one if 
as you get more advanced, or if you're going to be cranking bugles all day, then you want to get something a little bit thicker when you do that. They come in all different sizes, thicknesses, and frame sizes. Now, which one is right for you? I tell you this, start with the half inch frame. And there's other people who go, no, Joe, that's not right. You should start with the one that fits you. Well, it's a lot easier to use that half inch frame, even if you have a little bit wider palette and discover that and still make sounds and then go to a wider one, than it is to go to a wide one stick it in a small palette and be choking on that, right? Yeah. So, and that gets real, real, real frustrating. So I tell people, man, when you're going to, uh, when you're going to call, um, get that half inch right away. And, oh, RC, you brought up something about latex because you said that, what yeah. happened with the latex with you? It's important that uh, you put that thing in your mouth and way before you start hunting, and carry it in your mouth because generally when you're hunting, you've got it in your mouth for who knows how long, especially if you're in hot pursuit or whatever, you know, you need it right away. And I know that it gives me a, a sore throat. The latex does. So but the, if I get used to it, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the thing is, too, is some people are allergic to latex. Right. So I do know that um, I have heard, I believe it is Rocky Mountain Elk hunting calls that is now making uh, a diaphragm call that is a non-latex one. So if you have trouble with latex, that's something for you to look into. OK, so th the thing I want to tell you is I kind of broke this down a little bit for the diaphragm call. The diaphragm call is what. I believe in what I like because I want myself as hands-free as possible. Again, when I coach, it's about eliminating failure points. And external calls, there's external calls for cow calls. There's external calls for, um, for bugling. There's external calls for um, doing what they would call an insistent buzz or some they call them an estrus call. There's some for doing calf talk, right? There's, uh, there's all different kinds of externals. You saw one that Gilbert had there. Uh, Chav talked about the hoochie mama, which is basically a hand squeeze is what you do with the hoochie mama. Okay. There's a smaller hoochie and there's a larger hoochie mama. That's a hand squeeze. And, let me tell you about that. I know that there are some world champion elk callers that during competitions would be to sound like a herd would be using a mouth diaphragm while squeezing a hoochie mama as well. Oh, yeah. to add that variety. Yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah. no, it's a, it's a makes fantastic elk sounds, you know, um, and that at times that's all you need. You know, I remember 11 years ago, uh, a man gave me my first diaphragm call and my first grunt tube, right? And uh, said, man, if you want to do this the right way, you got to learn how to call elk. And uh, I wanted to do that. I mean, I, I love doing that. We we rattle in deer down here. We call in deer here. Uh, we love turkey hunting, call in turkey. So Joe gave me my first uh, elk calls of Primos Black and uh, – I started working with that, and I, to this day, I can promise you, Primo's Black will be in my mouth when I'm elk hunting. So uh, I love that call. It's easy to easy for me to blow. Uh, I trim it, and uh, man, you know, it makes the the right type of sounds. And you know, Joe, that's another thing I want to kind of talk about too: is making those sounds. A lot of times, a bull will respond to a different diaphragm yes. sound differently. Yes. You might be, might be making a real sweet call with one, one and he not saying anything. You switch to a, maybe a little more higher pitch or lower pitch or even a, a, a those cow sounds we make, those lower tone cow sounds are real important. That low tone, well, man, that might just you know fire him up, you know. And I've seen RC go to the buzz when he used that hyper call and whoo that just blows them up, you know? So sometimes it's those little different sounds that you can make that really, so don't get hooked on just one thing. If you're not getting the results you need, try some, you know, that's why we got a bunch of calls in our bag, 
you yeah. know, and I'm, we're going to keep trying till we find a hot button. Somewhere. I carry four or five different calls with me. And one of the reasons I do that too, is I like to keep duplicates of what's working for me. Yeah. In other words, I like to keep two yeah, of the same too. type of calls for cow calling. I want to keep two for, you know, for bugling with, um, because if one starts to get warm, and, and I don't want to stretch it yeah. and I'll and, and get too wet. I'll switch to another one and let that one relax for a little while, you know, and, yeah. and, and that preserves the life of it a little bit. Now, um, one thing I want to make sure that people understand is, is that, you know, when you're using a diaphragm call, um, we, a lot of people have seen something like this. this is called a grunt tube and you'll see them in all different types of grunt tubes. Mine is different than the popular baths that you're seeing today. That looks like one of your, your kids' um, uh, plastic wiffle baths out there. It's a little bit bigger. Um, it should and, be in cut out. So. Yeah. And a lot of people see these, and then when we make a noise, <laughs> they think a lot of times that there's something in here <laughs> making the noise, <laughs> and it's actually the diaphragm in the mouth that's making the noise. Now... Yeah. There are, there are tubes that have external um, devices on them to make sounds, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I know. Pre this is like I said. This this has an external tube that goes on the end of it. If you can see, I mean, you see where it clamps in right there. Um, and there is a smaller version of this, a pocket version. But like I said, I take the tube off though because I like to use my own grunt tube, like you, Joe. But this stays in my. It stays in my in my bag all the time. So, you know, these grunt tubes, they have nothing inside of them. They're completely empty inside yeah. there. This is uh, just, just a flex. Yeah, it's just a flex tube right there. This right here yeah. um, is uh, something I keep in my pack. It's called a game changer. And what a game changer does is it gives you a small uh, a small form factor to be able to do calls with this so that um, – uh, you can actually, you know, ex expand what that sounds like, or you can actually diffuse what it sounds like to make it sound like it's farther away. So yeah. that is a tube right there. Now, this one does have something inside of it. And you'll yeah. see that it actually has a, um, uh, yeah, it has uh, latex inside there that creates back pressure. And back pressure, that's the problem with a tube like this. A tube like this when it takes a lot of uh, air in order to blow because there's no back pressure. Whereas when you have a mouthpiece like this that creates back pressure, you can bugle yeah. easier and make sounds easier with that. So, I mean, this has come a long way. I used to use the hoses off radiators. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I can remember, Chav, do you remember the the little gas tubing that stands. Oh yeah. Used. <laughs> hey, Carl Gannon, yeah. Carl Gannon had a copper tube he kept in his pack all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah, that that copper tubing gave that real, real, uh, real uh, musical tone at the end of a, of a bugle. That yeah. that you know when you hear a a bull that that has that musical tone is just amazing. And not I, all bulls do that, but you know that that kind of uh, replicated it. Yeah, I, I tell you what, man, I, I never forget. It was windier than heck. It was the last day of the hunt. I had a bad attitude, and Stan Samuels gets out of the vehicle in that friggin' 30 mile an hour wind and pulls out a piece of gas tubing to blow one of them little, like, you know, Chav said, it's got this real musical but, but low sound. And I'm like, I'm in the back, like, you gotta be kidding me, man. And all of a sudden, this booger blew up. Oh my God! And uh, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't thirty minutes later. I had shot a six by six up on top of that hill that started with a little tin whistle <laughs> on the last day. So, uh, yeah, you just never know sometimes. So, there are external calls that you use for cow sounds. Um, there's a, a lot of different quality, quality cow sounds. And I have buddies that are guides that use these external, like you were talking about RC, that one called, the uh, um, drive them crazy. And yeah. there's the Make extra, yeah. 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 Making them go bull Fighting crazy. Cow or something Fighting like that. Cow. Yeah. yeah. And they're all, um, externals. Now, 
just like you can, you can do the same thing with a diaphragm call where you get too much saliva and you mess up. But it's that's one of the things you got to be careful of as an external is is um, getting yep. condensation or saliva in it, and you know all of a sudden it you know makes some kind of a crazy noise for it. So You're calling Bex instead of L. So what I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to do for a recommendation for you guys is that here's what I'm going to recommend you get. Grinders tuning in, thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our base camp elk hunting training camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. And this is what I use. And you already heard Gilbert. Gilbert said a Phelps black or a Phelps white with a pallet plate on it. They're inexpensive diaphragm calls. You just have to know sometimes how to move that pallet plate a little up and down to tune it, all right? I, I will correct you, Joe. I said Primos. I'm sorry, what did I say? Did I say Phelps? Phelps, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Primos. But we like Phelps too. Yes, I do. Um, and it, it is, that was the Primos black and white. Um, both of those are really good for making sounds. Now I will tell you this, if you want to get sounds coming right out of the box, um, the Elk 101, Champ, All-Star, Contender, yeah. those are really yeah. great to learn how to make cow calls and get some sounds right out there. Really soft latex um, um, to a medium latex and they make sounds right away. Yeah, and it makes it actually has that little cut in it. You know, it actually has where when you blow that call, it'll go. Yeah. It'll have that little that little cut down, and you don't have to do it with our calls that we use, Joe. You got to make it cut down, you know, with your air pressure. Mm -hmm. But that one on one you're talking about, you don't have to do it, man. It almost does it for you. It's a really good call. Yeah, that's good info. And so that's those three. So we've said the Primos, we've said the Rocky Mountain. Um, myself, the ones that I like to keep with me is I like to keep the um, Phelps Amp Black, uh, which is what I use for cow calling. That's going to be, I do cow call, small bulls. I do just about everything with that call. I always have two of them. Anytime I have a soft latex, I'm going to keep two to three of them because, and then I'm going to have some back at camp in case I blow some out, right? Okay. And then I've got the, the amp gray. This is the first mm -hmm. Phelps call that I ever used. I loved it because it's an all around. You can cow call, you can bugle. It's got good latex on it. It lasts very well. Um, the other ones that I like are the pitch black here one and the pitch black two. 
Uh, there's yeah. some that I'm going to be trying experimenting with this year, the green. I want to see what that's like. Uh, I have the Maverick. I, I like the Maverick for when I have a time that I'm going to be screaming a lot of bugles. I'm going to be doing a lot of locating or the bulls are reacting to bull noises. Then I want to have something that I can do without blowing it out. And that's going to be one of these. And the thing about the thing about thicker latex calls is sometimes you just got to scream on them for a while before they yeah, to get them. To the yeah. Before they break into that sweet spot right there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a recommendation as far as your grunt tube goes. If you are calling, if you are partner calling and you're calling for somebody, it does not matter what grunt tube you use because you can aim your calls. You can turn, you can do some movement that you can get away with. Um, I always recommend if you're hunting solo that you need to have a flexible tube call. You want something that like this, that you can actually, because I do not believe in using a grunt tube. Once I have an animal located and I'm calling them in, I never want to call towards that animal. I never want them to think I'm closer than what I am. So I'm going to use this so that I have it strung on me just like so. It, it, yeah. it'll lay right in the side. I can have my bow. I can actually pull it up. And if that animal is not going where he wants, I can go ahead and make a sound and turn it behind me and get it out of my way. I always have my eyes on the animal. So I think that is critical to the technique that I use right there. All right. I'm telling you, it's been instrumental in me killing some bulls that I've actually called in, Joe. And I, I'm serious because when you get in tight and you got them right at you, you can't sound like you're in their face, you know. Um, it, it, by having that thing strung up where I can just bend my head down and, you know, push, the, you can rotate that call backwards and forwards with your hand. You can rotate it backwards and forwards, really small movement, and just tilt your head down, and you can throw a call behind you to make you sound like you're 100 yards away. And, yeah. and that settles the elk down, right? Yep. I've watched it many times. They get nervous. They get a little whiff of you or something. They get nervous, and then you – hit that little calming cow call that's away from you. And man, I mean, they'll settle right down, you know? So, so let me ask you guys this, when you guys first started calling or Chav, when what you you guys are doing this, what are some of the difficulties that you guys come across um, trying to call? Well, just trying to get a, a, a noise out of it when I first started it was kind of difficult. And it, to the point that I kind of looked at the diaphragm and said, does it go this way or does it go this way, you know? And I know that's that's going back to the very basics, but a lot of people when they first buy one, uh, which way does it go? <laughs> yeah, the pallet to the top right. and the flat side towards the front. So, and there's also a tendency for it to tickle your pallet. So you know that made it kind of like a, I don't think I want to try this. You know, it it tickles it and makes it, it makes it feel kind of weird. And uh, then get, like you mentioned before, is just getting one that fits your pallet right. And so trimming would be a big thing, you know, trim it to fit your, your mouth. So, so, so how did you get past the tickling of the palate, bud? Well, I just, uh, I ended up getting a, which you haven't mentioned is a, a Carlton, a native Carlton. It's got like a metal frame on top, which I thought was kind of weird, but for some reason it, it fit my palate and, uh, it, it didn't tickle it. And just the fact that uh, you do get more success with uh, with that type of call, uh, I stuck with it, and it, it kind of went away. You know, <laughs> maybe the fit made a big difference. Right, and and I think that's what it is. You did not have that latex laying against your palate because it was so small. It be the Carlton's are a little wider on the frame. They're that five eighths frame. So evidently you had too small of a, a frame. So it's setting up against your palate and, and then it's just vibrating. vibrating against that and tickling your palate. Yeah. 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 But once I, I got it trimmed up, off, they, it kind of stopped. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, the Pennsylvania cat killer, he got a bad gag reflex. So been oh, rough God. on him to find something <laughs> to fit. You know, been trying to rough on him to try to find something to fit. And he, we actually trimmed one up for him. Everything made it fit a little better. He's still working on his, his sounds with it. But 
Uh, at the end of the day, he found something that wasn't doing that and gagging him all the time. So a lot of guys, you know, have to have trouble with that, but it's about fit. It really is. That gag yeah. reflex comes from putting it too far back and you got that tape stick yeah. back there where it shouldn't be. Right. And I think when you talked about the different types of latex and the, the, the thickness and all that, I think that, that helps a lot because, you know, when it was when I did buy my my uh, first diaphragm call, uh, I just went to the store and there were tons of them. And it's like, well, gee, where do I start? Yeah. And I said, oh, this one looks kind of nice. I'll buy that one. Right. <laughs> and that's how I bought my first my first one, just by by a, an impulse buy, not necessarily the brand name or the type of uh, latex it had. They all seem to appear to be the same size as far as width and all that stuff. So, yeah. Well, you know. and, and when you see a call that says big bull and you see one that says little bull, you're like, dude, I want me a big bull. So, <laughs> that one, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but it, it's a, it's a thicker latex and you know, it's going to give that raspy noise and, and it's more difficult to call with, especially it is. If you're trying to do some cow calls. So, you know, uh, that's why, you think about the softer the sound, the softer the latex. You know, the harsher the sound, the thicker the latex. It's going to stand up and last longer. And then you have those medium range, like I said, that that gray is. That that and uh, I like. And when you take a look at the pitch blacks, the one and two, the one is just that. The one is the softer latex. The two gets a little bit thicker. And then there's actually a three that's even thicker than that. I like the one and two that I deal with there. Now, does it say that on the, on the packaging or is it something that uh, you're assumed to know? You know, there is a, you can actually find a matrix. If you go online and you look up Phelps call matrix, if you do a search for that uh, in images, you'll see a matrix that comes up and it actually creates like a scale from softest uh, out to the, the thicker and, and, and more tighter as it goes there. So uh, take a look at that matrix and keep them, you know, where it, your skill set is. And I tell people, look, I used that Primo's black and Primo's white for 30 years well, shoot, 30 plus yeah. years. Um, and those were considered uh, small bull cow calls. And I used those and killed 30 some bulls with that. So um, it doesn't, it's, it's about what you do and you can add voice inflection to make them sound bigger or if you want yeah. them or, or badder. But it's all about, when you make certain calls and just get in those tones. And I, and I found that as long as you sound like a great cow call, you know, um, we always did the lover before fighter. There's different things that you can do with that, but we'll talk about that on a different phase. So what about some other difficulties that, you know, what about you, Gilbert? Uh, for me, it was just about, uh, you know, putting the time in with the call, you know, um, when you first get a noise, it's going to sound like a cat meow and, and, uh, and you know, you, yeah, yeah. And, and it's really about getting that diaphragm in the right spot and, uh, understanding where that is. Uh, for me, it was so good cause you know, I taped a lot of what Joe did so I could hear him. And then I could hear some others, you know, Paul Medell's out there, the elk nut. I mean, you can hear what a call is supposed to sound like and you take yourself uh, but for me, it was just about the length of time it took me to make a good elk sound, right? And it was because, you know, you just got with a diaphragm, you you got to put in the time, and then all of a sudden it'll just cling. You'll start making a, a couple of good sounds, and then you start adding to that, and then it, it it's really like, man, you can get, and I won't say don't want to sound weird, but you can get romantic with that that thing man you can actually really work on you can you you can actually feel the passion in the call and uh and before you know it you'll get in some scenarios where now you're in a herd and you can really see what's happening because you can focus on what you're doing to the herd the whole nine yards you know so it, for me joe it is so important for you to put the time in and be patient yeah Absolutely. Uh, you, yeah. Are your buddies going to give you hell? 
because they are right. And, uh, and but you got to go through that phase of getting razzed and getting people to t- calling you the cat killer and this, that, and the other, you know, cat caller, whatnot. I mean, take a look at Luis, man. I mean, he's super sharp, you know. Now. Yeah, that's just an incentive to get better. When people do yeah. something like that, they, and really, it, yeah. it, it's it's without them going, no, you don't sound good at all. They give you a hard time, yeah. so they try to give you incentive to get better. And there's, you know, you got to understand, man, you know, people care and want you to get better. Now, one thing that I, I want to do is, you're right, Gilbert, people have a hard time getting a sound out of that. And yeah. I'm going to show you how to get that first sound because what's critical is most people try to – they try to um, get the sound by using the front of their tongue and putting pressure on the latex. And really, that's not the part of your tongue that you want going across that. It's all about just like having that, that blade of grass flat right there. So you want the wide, flat part of your tongue is what's going to put that pressure on there. Here's how you get that feeling right there. Put that in, and you're going to say, with. <laughs> Wish, 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 and it's automatically going to put your tongue in that position or push, 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 wish, wish, wish. And once you get that, wish. And here's the other thing I see people trying to change tones. This happens to everybody that I teach. Yeah. They try to change tones by using their lips to create. And that's where you get that cat thing. They use their lips to, and they do something like this. Yeah. 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 That's the kitty cat. And we don't want to do any of that. You see, it's about the noise that you get. It's the high pitch and you just, you just let the pressure off. So to learn that, the step I teach people to learn that is what I call a drop jaw technique. So all you're going to yeah. do is. <coughs> and as you learn to, to do that, you f- and you start to learn what the pressure feels like, then you start to be able to do it smoother, easier, and it sounds more like. You get those more, better, smooth nuances in there. But just wish, wish, (coughs) no, (coughs) nothing with the lips. They don't do anything. It's just wish (coughs) and then (coughs) drop the jaw. (coughs) And then the bugle is just the opposite. So one is dropping off and the other is putting up. Okay. That's, and in fact, a lot of times guys get their bugle before they get their cow call. And what I tell them is if you want to get the correct tone of the cow call, then you just go to your bugle tone and you hear that tone and then just come off of it. And, and so it's like this, here's my bugle tone going to it. And so I hit that. And I learned to tone it down with less air. So it, the bugle and the cow call are basically yin and yang, man. They just reverse each other out. That's all you do. So that's how you get those sounds out of that, just like that. Okay? Unbelievable stuff, Joe. Like I said, making sounds. I mean, Joe didn't, Joe didn't teach us like that. He's like, here's the call. Go put the time in, right? <laughs> uh, kind of like how I learned how to swim. Grandpa threw me out of the boat and said, swim. You know, uh, now you can take lessons. And now we're giving lessons on how to call. I mean, it's just unbelievable stuff. And it's, it, it is a – we said this at the opening of the podcast. This is an absolute game changer to your elk hunting strategy. You know, we Being have- able to call – amazing deal we have one more thing because rc brings a unique um an, a unique viewpoint too because rc tell us what makes it so difficult for you bud well the fact that i have dentures so you know these new calls 
I used to struggle with the black one, the uh, Primos, mm -hmm. and I can make noise, but these new ones that have that metal Dome. piece in it, mm -hmm. it's like it really seals better. And, you know, you're going to have to, just like you said, you know, as far as your pellet, you know, it's the same way as your denture. Your denture is not, you know, it's not going to, once you figure out which one's going to fit perfect, then you're, uh, it works pretty good. I was yeah. going to say, I mean, you know, it's like you say, it's a game changer. You think about it. I had an incident one time that, I had that uh, uh, hyper cow call and I called the bull in and I had it in my mouth. Well, the bull came in 20 yards. I pulled my recurve back and pew, there went my call. And there went the bull and the arrow went pew, threw it straight in the ground. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> the beautiful part about a mouth call is that you don't have your hands are free yeah. you know all you got to do i mean if the bull you know you go to full draw and the bull decides he wants to leave all you got to do is yeah and yeah Freezing. he's going to turn around he's going to give you a shot mm -hmm. most of the time yeah, yeah. you know I've, I've had i've had the pleasure to hunt with all three of these guys I was with R.C. Knox one time on a mountain, and he was so good with that hyper call. Not only did he call in a bull, but he called in another hunter on us. And uh, R.C. <laughs> will never forget that day, I promise you. <laughs> I was I thinking about that day. <laughs> so, like so, I said, R.C., these guys are so good with their calling, man. I've been so, so blessed to have them around me and – uh, you know, Carl Gamage too. He was not a big caller, but when he did, was very effective, right? Um, Joe and RC, I've been with both of them where we've called in hunters, we've called in, you know, lots of bulls and, and uh, cows and spikes and stuff like that. But it was because they were able to change the game by speaking the language is the reason why we had so many success. Right. Yeah. So, you know, this part of it, we're, we're hoping that you guys have a little bit more insight about what you can get, um, what you need to get. To find one of these flexible tubes like we have is real difficult these days. You can actually find them at Walmart. Um, you can look up the Carlton Mega Tube, but man, they're almost gone. But I'm telling you, um, come next year, there's going to be a new flexible tube on the market. It's called the Elk Bros Soloist, man. So we, you know, and, awesome. and, and look, this came out of necessity because, you know, we heard that Hunter Specialties quit making. They're going to quit making the flexible tube, which we use the whole time. And the problem, too, was the back pressure on it. So, you know, I took a look at it and said, look, we still need to have flexible tubes for us to call with. Maybe we can do something to create better back pressure, maybe a better sound out the front. And thus, that's why you see on, on, on the prototype, I have a sound chamber that goes in the, the top of this and that I have a special mouthpiece that goes on that creates that back pressure. So, um, and it wasn't done because we really wanted to. I just looked and I was like, what am I, where are we gonna get these now? So you can go look and I think you can find a couple of them still in stock on Amazon. Look up the Carlton Mega Grunt Tube. Um, it's Hunter Specialties, I believe, is who's making it. Uh, you can sometimes find them at Walmart if you're lucky, okay? So if you want to use a flexible. If you're not soloing and you're partner calling, it don't mean diddly, man. Whatever's going to make the best sound for you. So um, there's some incredible, you know, Phelps makes the bats and they make them in the smaller, the bigger, they now they came out with an aluminum one. Um, the Rocky Mountain elk hunting, the Rocky Mountain elk hunting calls are and make all kinds of different grunt tubes, um, different ways to change things on them. So you can find all that, but just understand that you want a grunt tube that you're comfortable with, that's going to serve your purpose, whether, you know, if you're going to hunt partner, don't worry about it. If you're going to hunt solo, then you got to think a little bit more about what you're doing there because 
it's not the calling the bull to 100 yards as hard. It's not the part that's calling him to 80 yards as hard. It's what do you do when that animal staring 80 yards out and starts to go the wrong way, and now you have to throw a call in a direction with minimal movement. That's when it gets difficult. Or if you're calling an animal and you've got that big grunt tube in your hand and they're coming in tight, what are you going to do with that? Well, you're going to put it down on the ground and – I don't know. Once I put some on the ground, it's lost. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just there forever for the next forever time. and ever. It's gone right. forever, man. <laughs> donated to donated to the ecosystem. That's what absolutely. I hope somebody finds them, man. I hope they're Joe, walking around with some of our grunt tubes. You know, yeah. Joe. I, I know you. We've talked about calls and uh, different types of calls and mm-hmm. what we thought are you know reasons were hard to call but there are some free calls out there that you don't even need that you can help to make yourself uh Look, more successful right yeah like okay if if you're if you're solo and you've got a bull that's coming in on you and like rc said he's coming across and he's hitting a window and you don't have a diaphragm call or anything like that uh, and you want to stop him just go Yo! just make a noise Yo! You know, just all you got to do, man. You can do it in different ways. You can inhale, exhale, whatever. Just get that, oh, you know, oh, just like that. And that bull will stop and look at you. And also, you know, some of the best calls out there are breeding sounds that bulls make that are so – you take a grunt tube, and I don't care if it's this one. I don't care if it's this one. I don't care if it's a bat. And it's just <laughs> – you get those pants going in there you get those huffs like that um and and it doesn't take anything i can use my voice i can i just make those sounds and that sounds like a frustrated bull like that okay and i am telling you this getting a stick and raking a tree and not just sitting there just throwing it on the limbs and like you know it's like get that thing get it on sometimes on the side of the tree like a like a, a an antler that's on the side or maybe in a pine tree or then take the tip of that thing and scrape it just like the front of a horn that's hitting on the front of a tree and get that sound so it's Think about a bull going up and down and then, you know, you make those sounds as, as much like an actual animal moving those horns up and down on that tree. Be the critter. You do that and things really start to go so much better for you. But those noises and oh, here's, here's one. This is my favorite. Well- That's all you gotta do is just do it on the on the front of that tube, just with a flat hand. You get that clunk 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 clunk, and kind of do it. And don't do it. Don't yeah. Just don't go boom 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 because that's not how an elk moves. It's boom 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 when they're when they're running and moving and stuff. So you just have to envision that right there. The best free sounds that will drive a bull nuts, man, because that glunking says that a bull is tending a cow. And you do that. Yeah, that's a hot cow. Oh, man. Yep. All you got to do is give a few of those sounds like a lost cow and get a couple of breathing noises with those pants and that glunk in there. And that paints the picture right there. So those are some of the best free ones, man. Fantastic stuff, Joe. Let's always uh, uh let's go to the mail. Always box, fantastic bro. to hear from the best help caller. You bet, man. So go ahead, go ahead and read the first one, bro. All right. This is from Landell Lewis of Bemidji, Minnesota. Landell says, Hey fellas, I love listening to your podcast. I listen to it every day at work over my earbuds. He sent me another email. He says, I'm a I'm a a big um what what do you call it? Big machine driver, you know? Yeah. Uh, heavy equipment driver. Yeah. Heavy equipment. There you go. Thank you, bro. You bail me yeah. out, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a heavy <laughs> equipment driver. So I I you know, I wear those soundproof things with my earbuds, and that's how I'm able to listen to you guys all day. It's not like I'm slacking at work or something, you know. <laughs> so uh, he says we appreciate uh, you listening, brother. 
Yeah. He yeah. says, me and a few buddies are going on our first elk hunt in Montana for rifle season. One of us has a bull tag and we've got um, two cow tags. Our trip is planned for the beginning of November. What are some of the best things you guys put in your pack as far as food and equipment? What are some of the must have emergency things needed to have with you? Also, and I think we'll start with this last one because I think it's the easiest. Also, what would you recommend as far as bear protection? Do you think bear spray is good enough? Sincerely, your biggest fan in Bemidji, Minnesota. First of all, Landel, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being one of our biggest fans. And uh, Joe, you want to attack the bear thing quick? Well, all I know, Gilbert, is this. I don't carry anything, and my wife yells at me all the time, but I don't live in Grizz country. If I lived in yeah. Grizz country and Montana, and, yeah. and those critters, um, when they're hungry, they eat. And yes, I, I don't, I don't want them using bear spray as pepper to eat me. I don't want that happening. I think if I was in Grizz country, I think – for the first time in my life, I would be packing a weapon and uh, I would have it in some place that is um, where I can get accessible. It. Yeah. accessible. Accessible. Yes. So they have them now, Joe. They have holsters now that are on the back side of your bino case. Yeah. You can actually put you a, a good compact 40 or 10 millimeter right there in the back side of your bino case where it's real easy to get to. And, yeah. uh, that and you also want to check your local laws and stuff like that. But being it's rifle season, yeah. I think it'd be no problem to have a, a handgun with you. And uh, I'm with you, Joe. I, I think I, I take me some bear spray along. And you know, they got a thing now, it's called a bear popper. It's a really loud noise uh, that you can actually, it's compressed air in, a, in a, a, a small object and you set it off. And man, it sounds like a, a seven millimeter magnum going off and that kind of startles them stuff like that the big thing is you want to get separation between you and that grizzly but you know, do not do uh, it by turning and, and, and run not get in his way yeah you no no don't yeah. run don't run no you yeah. you want to get as big as possible you want to stay facing that critter be ready to defend yourself um if you have to and just keep putting space between you and that critter there man and hopefully they decide that there's something else they'd rather get beside you so um yeah, I, I, yeah. me, I would not just depend on bear spray. Um, that's just me. No, no, I'd have my handgun with me for sure. Yeah. Um, so, what are some emerg What are some must-have emergency things um, needed to have with you? Dry socks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah well you can do a lot of things with dry socks man you can wear them you can use them as gloves you can put them over top of something else um you can yep. start a fire with them there's a lot of things uh you can store food inside of them we okay. always store food inside our uh, a pair of wool socks um yep. to try to keep them quiet and then we actually have an extra pair if we need them we have like we said you got extra gloves in case you need them in case of emergency um i'm gonna i'm gonna say you, you got to have a, a sat device either a zolio or an in reach with you mm -hmm. when you're out there make sure that you yes. have especially since it's november i would say you have two bic 99 cent bic lighters in your thing and you have yep. some fire starter that will start when it's wet you know that uh will light when it's wet rain uh, rain here of some kind little cotton little cotton balls dipped in that vaseline man work amazing Rain gear of some kind, maybe a poncho, because yep. you know that, yeah. that, that time of year it's going to rain. So, yeah, November could either be snow or rain, right? In November, right? Yeah, and you do not want to get wet if it gets cold down in temperatures. So, as long as you have that sat device as well, and you also take um, extra rechargeable uh, charger banks with you in case you need to charge up yeah. a phone or a sat device or something because those sat devices have sos button features on them to identify where you at and to get people to you when you need help you need to have you need to have a, a med kit a small first aid kit with the right types of things in there that can do be blood clot blood clotting if you need it any of your medications in case you have something like that that you need that um there's some things that uh they make now that will help uh kind of suture or butterfly if you have a bad cut 
um, and things to be able to compress with. And those are things that you may never, ever need. But if you do need it, it's going to save your life. And uh, go on to the Elk 101 website because Corey did a first aid kit from an incident that happened two years ago where a guy jammed a broadhead in his leg. And, you know, from that came some things that, uh, that they carry. And so that's a good thing to look at as well there. What about food and equipment? What, would, what do you guys carry with you? I think I'd have a flashlight for sure and maybe extra batteries. Of course, you'll need your knives. And, you know, for me, we have a field dress oh. pack that we carry. Um, and then food-wise, food wise, man, I like a peanut butter. I like a peanut butter bacon and honey sandwich. That's kind of my go-to <laughs> thing. And then I usually bring some, Sounds good. I usually bring some dried elk jerky or dried, dried sausage. <laughs> and, and then uh, trail mix. Uh, what do you call that, Joe? You make, you make it... Um, Granola, you yeah, know, it's mixed granola. in with yeah. trail mix. Uh, what do they call that stuff? Uh, it, it well, I just call it grinder love granola. We mix our own, and we have a we have a formula for that, uh, yeah. a recipe on our site. But all I was going to say, bro, is if you're going to make that that peanut butter and bacon sandwich in Montana bear country. I want you at the back of the line. Right? So, <laughs> I'm going to throw that to the bear, Joe. I can get away. <laughs> uh, my advice would be to make sure that you can outrun whoever you're with. <laughs> yeah. All right. All you got to do is shoot your partner. Shoot your partner in the knee. It's over. <laughs> yeah. then take off. Um, but, uh, uh, Lando, if you go to our site and you go on to the, the prep, if you look, there's a, there's a season prep on our site on elkbros.com and we actually do pack dump. We have a pack dump on there to show some of the things oh, yeah. on our pack. So, um, that might help you out there. So uh, hopefully those things help you out and, and you're ready to rock with that. I think we'll do one more out of this. We have justice, um, Friedel from Oregon and we have Ed Morris in the lineup from Louisville. Kentucky um and and Ed's is is pretty much well I think we'll do Ed's because I think we can hit that pretty quick Ed said uh curious if any of you wear snake gators in early season bow hunts we hunt the San Juans in early September and uh have never had any close incidents but the old triangle heads are still out in force have you all had any close incidents after a a rash of venomous bites here in Kentucky this year it has me wondering if we need to invest in Kentucky, yes, invest. Where we hunt, no, <laughs> haven't had a, I, I have seen the grass snake and garden variety, which Joe says there's never a snake up there, but there are, uh, but just <laughs> very not venomous. We've never seen anything venomous where we hunt, but I promise you in Kentucky, they're gonna still be out. RC, what do you think? Well, I, you know, I, Beg to differ because I've actually killed some big snakes, rattlesnakes up there where you guys have been hunting. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, there, yes. In September, <laughs> you know where the the Iron Gate is. I've killed two there. In in September. Oh my God! So anyway, <laughs> oh uh, in what September, I was going to say is that I I think you I would do my homework and ask and figure out you know if he's going to San Juan. Um, what time of year is going bow hunting? Yeah. So that, and, that's what I was asking, RT, was it September when you saw that snake? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. But the thing about it is, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a big investment, but yet at the same time, if he's living in Kentucky where these snakes are crazy, yeah. you know, why would you not get something like that and, and you know, have it if okay. you need it? You can, ask, you can ask Joe, I wear snake boots when I elk hunt. I mean, yeah. I'm so comfortable in them because we wear them year round down here in Texas. I mean, right. big, mm -hmm. big, not only do they protect not from snake bite, but they protect me from the early morning dew. I don't have to wear a gator. Uh, right. And they protect from brush and uh, rock, you know, high, big boulders, stuff like that. It really protects your legs. So, I, you know, I wear a Cabela's Pinnacle. Uh, snake boot. You can't even get them anymore. I'm so mad at Cabela's for discontinuing that boot. It was the best boot oh, ever yeah. made. That, I want you to know. That and, and Mindles. 
Yeah, huh. best food ever made, and I'm mad at Cabela's. I've had several talks with them, but uh, again, I don't, I don't mind wearing them. They're lightweight too. They're Gore-Tex. Uh, they're waterproof. So, um, you know, if you're gonna hunt where you think there's gonna be snakes and it's lower elevation, uh, I think the higher elevation it gets colder at night. Those snakes go, you know, they get dormant and they go, they go hide, especially when you're gonna be in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but once it warms up here in Texas to 70 degrees, I promise you, they, our dens are shallow. Whereas up there where y'all are at, the dens may be a lot deeper. So it's got to really warm up for them to come out. You know what I mean? So I've worn tennis shoes and stuff for 30 some years and I, I, I've never had an incident myself. And I'm not saying that they're not out there and it's not possible. You just got to be diligent where you're stepping. You should be looking where you're stepping and where you're going anyway. So, you know, I, I don't think when I'm hunting out, you know, uh, elk hunting, I ever put my feet down where I don't know where they're going. And, uh, you know, you can kind of tell the types of areas too where you're know, more apt to have a rattlesnake in it because they're not going to be in that dark stuff. They're going to be out there where they can get some sun and then get shade. Yeah. And shade. So, right. you know, yeah. that's the kind of place they're going to be. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, last one is, hey, yeah. fellas, last season I was in a situation where we were driving back from a hunt late at night in the dark. And, and this is from Justice Friedel in, in Oregon. Um, and we were stopping at some location, do some night bugling, trying to locate a bull. We pulled over, waited about 10 minutes and let one rip into a canyon with a clear cut. We ended up having a bull respond probably only 100 yards away. We kept wow. quiet and we're looking at the map. And about three minutes later, the bull responded and it sounded like it was 20 yards below us. He ended up busting us and running away. But what is the proper way to deal with that situation? Thanks for the podcast. Mm -hmm. Just here. Bro, when he opens up at 100 yards, you got to get the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just leave me. He'll be there yeah. in the morning. What are you bad? Yeah. Yeah. You just got to, I mean, uh, if you guys had jumped out of the truck, um, then I would get into the truck and I would start driving out because, you know, those animals are used to hearing them and that truck's going to take the scent inside of it and just back out of the situation. Mark it on the map when you get a little bit of ways from that, that you had it there, but no, definitely. And hopefully if you end up in that situation where they bust you, maybe they saw something and they didn't smell you. you hopefully it's something like that, but you got to back out. If you have a critter there, hundred yards and it's at night you don't want to hang around man you, you got to get out of that situation asap and there's a good chance that if he does come up there and sense where you know that there was a human there that it might be you know you're just out of luck with that anyway but uh don't stay there man because they'll they'll get on top of you real quick and then you educate them guys if you like what we're doing please subscribe rate and review us you got to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com and just a reminder if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show just send your questions to info at elkbros.com that's i-n-f-o at elkbros.com fantastic show joe i mean so many things that we packed into that that can help our grinders out there hit the elk woods and use their calls and not be afraid to make a mistake. You guys put the time in, get behind that call, and great things are going to happen for you. And we can't wait to see the pictures coming out here starting in September. We just really just about a month away from us getting up there and hearing the bugles ourselves. I can't wait. Uh, I, what's going to be really cool is I get to share elk camp again with all my brothers here. So, Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be a, a fun time for sure. Like with your wives, wives, kiss your husband, hug your babies, kiss your, keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry, and we'll see you next week right here on the Blue Collar Elk Hunting. And for all the grinders out there, don't forget, here it is again, some music from our brother Tony Wintrip to close out the show. Peace, peace, everybody. Peace. Stop. Well, I met her down at Tombstone Willie. With all the guys inside Staring down a long blonde girl With baby blue loving eyes I told her if she was thirsty She could put one of them on my tab Then she said, no thanks I'm a farmer's daughter I'll use the money I have Cause I wasn't born to run I'm not a son of a gun I work for everything I got you think that you're gonna smooth me over? Oh, I'm thinking probably not. You 
gonna have to show me those boots and that cowboy smile and show me that your short box lifted up Chevy out back and then boy we'll sit down and we'll talk a while yeah we'll sit down and we'll talk a while Let me hear your background run around Everything held up inside And if you like both seamless Or Alabama every night And tell me, do you know those tides When those razor clams show And do you rope and do you ride Or boy, do you gotta go Cause I wasn't born to run I'm not a son of a gun I work for everything I got And my daddy never raised me the wrong way I was born around a coffee pot You're gonna have to pay your dues And work overtime And have to stay at home Cause I'll be begging you, boy To love me every Daddy never raised me the wrong way I was born around a coffee pot You're gonna have to show me that ring With that big bright shine And a cross around your neck With a big old smile We'll sit down and we'll talk a while Yeah, we'll sit down and we'll talk 